I'm going to ask that we bow our heads in prayer. Every head bowed and every eye closed. We've already had a wonderful evening of music and this wonderful message from Bonnie Barrows. Our hearts are already stirred and warmed and challenged and convicted by what we've heard and felt and seen. But God is speaking to you as an individual and calling you to himself tonight. And it's my prayer that on this night, you will respond to the call of Christ. Our Father, we thank thee and praise thee for a gospel at this moment of history that is good news, a gospel that thou dost love us, a gospel that tells us of the grace and the mercy of God in Christ. And we pray that many will respond this night to the saving grace and power of Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name, amen. Now I want you to turn with me, if you will, to the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews. The ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews, and I'll come to the text a little bit later. I want to speak tonight on the subject Three things, three things you cannot do without. Three things you cannot do without. One of our team members is named Roy Gustafson. And he always has a story for every occasion. And he always has a humorous story if you ask him. You don't even have to ask him, he'll tell it to you anyway. And he has a dry sense of humor. And he and I went to school together 30-some years ago down in Florida, and he was telling me the other day that he and his wife went to Toronto last Christmas, and they were window shopping, and they saw a strange thing in a window that they didn't know what it was, and so they went in to inquire as to what this strange contraption was. And uh, the man said, well, it's a mechanical dog scratcher. Said, if you have a dog and he gets itchy, you put him in one side and bring him out the other side, and this machine will scratch him. Well, he said that he had never seen anything like that. That's for the person that has everything, or for the dog that has everything. <laughs> and then he told me about a farm boy in New York City, uh, who went to New York City from the farm, and he stayed up there for a couple of days and walked up and down on Fifth Avenue, looked at all the shops, and when he got back, his daddy asked him how he liked it. He said, well, to be honest with you, I've never seen so many things that I could do without. <laughs> and that's the way you feel at Christmas time when you go shopping in some of the bigger cities. You know, when I was a boy, and, and I guess as you get older, you start saying, when I was a boy. And uh, some of your children and grandchildren start saying, Dad, tell us about the old days and nostalgia sort of gripped you. But you know, really, when I was a boy, it was just a short time ago, real short. Seems like yesterday. You know, we had no inside plumbing. Not too many people had it in those days. We had no radio. We had no television. Can you imagine no television? Why, we were at the poverty level with no inside plumbing out on our farm and no radio and no television, and most of the time, no electricity, no refrigeration except we had a spring where we would put the milk in and keep it cool. No motels, I never heard of a motel. Didn't know what that was. Very few automobiles would come down our road. Certainly it wasn't a paved road. It just had two ruts. And the mailman would come and he had the old Model T and he would come down those two ruts to bring us the mail. I can still remember that. Only a few highways were paved. No airlines. We had some trains. At least I heard we had them. I was about four or five, I guess, before I ever saw a train. And you know, if people lived like that today, now that's the way everybody lived then nearly. 
If people lived like that today, why every welfare group in the country would be going. All the TV cameras were there to take the picture of these poor, deprived people. That's how high the standards of living have gone in my lifetime. My father was not a poor man. He was not a wealthy man. He would be called middle income. He made whatever you can make on a two or three hundred acre red dirt farm in North Carolina. I never did look at his bank account, never knew how much he made. He seemed to have enough on the table and we always had one suit of clothes a year and we had five cents of ice cream every Saturday night and we did pretty well. Look at the Waltons, you'll see a little bit about how we live in those days in the mountains of North Carolina. You know, Immanuel Kant once said, a man is rich not by what he owns, but by what he can do without. You're not rich by what you own, but what you can do without. I've always remembered that statement. And as we're entering a recession, I guess we're in one, or a depression, whatever you call this that we're in, You'd be amazed at what you can do without. We may have to go back and live like we lived when I was a boy, and I, but I'll tell you, you could walk down the streets of all the towns around there and you wouldn't be afraid of being hit over the head or mugged. You never heard of a rape. I guess they had them, I never heard of them. I don't ever recall hearing about a murder in our community. And somehow or another, we children thought we were the happiest people in the world. And we had to work from three in the morning till sunset. My mother always served breakfast at 5.30 every morning. And we didn't know how bad off we were. <laughs> now the Bible says there are at least three things you can't do without. If you are to have joy, and peace and assurance and your sins forgiven and to know that you're going to heaven. What are they? The first one is found in Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. In other words, if Jesus Christ had not gone to the cross and shed his blood for your sins, you could never have forgiveness. You would be a lost soul. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You remember during the Red Guard Revolution in China a few years ago? They were using this same passage of Scripture, and you'll find a lot of uh, the sayings of Mao Zedong have been taken right out of the Bible and applied to communism or to his brand of communism. They, they were singing and chanting, without the shedding of blood, there's no revolution. That was one of their songs that they sang. I was in Moscow, and I remember that I asked them what the Red Star stood for. And I remember that our interest guide said they stand for the five continents, and it's red because it's going to take blood in order for the whole world to become communist. And you know, right down here in Mexico, I'm a great admirer of the Aztec civilization. And I like to read everything I can on the Aztecs because I did my theme in college and my graduation paper on blood sacrifice among the Aztecs. Did you know that the Aztecs used to take 20,000 people a year and slaughter them on their altars to their gods? Bloodshed. Where did they get such an idea? And did you know that in the Golden Bow, Fraser, which is one of the great classic works in anthropology, says that they've never found a tribe anywhere in the world or a people anywhere in the world that did not practice at some time or other blood sacrifice. And most societies have at one time or another practiced human sacrifice. Where did they get the idea of blood being shed to atone for sin to their gods? even in the red, white, and blue in our flag. The red stands for blood that was shed 
the sacrifice that was made by men to give us our freedom. The Red Cross that does so much good, that red stands for blood that is shed. And today, blood is splattered all over our television screens. 60% of all entertainment programs today have to do with violence. You go to the motion picture theater today, if, if the ads in the paper are any indication, and it must be just splattered with blood, as well as sex. Now why? Why do we shrink when we come from the blood in the Bible? Because from Genesis to Revelation, blood is shed. And why? Leviticus 17, 11, Moses said, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now, if you're an average person, you have five quarts of blood circulating in your body every 23 seconds. Blood carries the garbage out without contamination. It's the most mysterious substance in the whole anatomy. Nobody exactly knows all about the blood. And we're all related by blood. You may be a black man, a brown man, a yellow man. Whatever your background, you are related to me by blood. Our blood, can, if it's the same type, can be interchanged within the races. The scripture says, the apostle Paul said, God hath made of one blood all the nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. Sister. When I have a blood transfusion, as I've had on several occasions when I've had operations, I didn't ask him, what's the color of this man's skin? Yeah, um, yes, doctor. we are currently dealing with the structure of a sermon, particularly the body. Um, two days ago, we dealt with you know, the introduction and we saw um, <clears throat> an introduction done by C.D. Brooks. And we, we, we all marveled at how beautiful that introduction was. Now we're looking at the body of the sermon. Now, the number of divisions can be up to even as many as seven. Great preachers like Dr. Benjamin Reeves would use three points. And within those three points, you can have sub points. Others will have four or five, depending on the nature of the text and its uh, natural setting. Um, there should be a congruence in your argument. The body of the sermon is called the argument because there it deals with the intellect. It appeals to the intellect. Now, it should not be in such a way <clears throat> that it becomes a hindrance for the sermon. Um, in other words, um, each, although it is the the skeleton, <clears throat> excuse me, a skeleton um, is never beautiful. <laughs> Possible. There should be as much meat put or as much flesh added in order to that we see the skeleton. Um, preferably when a preacher preaches, the focus should not be on the skeleton, but the skeleton helps us to see where the preacher's, where is he starting and where he is going to. But it, it should not be done in a way that does not lead or, or leave a surprise, you know, um, otherwise it would be game over. Um, so when a, an audience listens, they want to listen with the ability to think, um, I wonder where this is going to lead. You sort of uh, know, but you still want to stay in there and listen. So here in Billy Graham's sermon, what I'm trying to, what we're trying to illustrate is simply this. 
is that he mentions three things in the offset he mentioned. So now, sometimes you may, may mention uh, the number of points before at the offset. Sometimes you may not, um, depending on how you feel. Preachers of uh, high caliber differ in this one. Some say you should, some say you should not. But whatever happens, <clears throat> you should be able to find one theme for your sermon. And whenever you feel that you are wandering off that theme, you should find a way back to that theme so that you do not allow for failure. Like uh, William Evans mentions about a particular preacher, after having preached, um, the, you know, he said to the um, elder, you know, I never knew what I was going to say before I went up there. And then uh, the elder replied, well, guess what? Uh, nobody knows what you spoke about when you're up there. So um, uh, having a single theme and being organized and having a transition from one point to another is imperative. Otherwise, your sermon, your sermon will be a dead sermon. Now, in this sermon of Billy Graham, there are three points that he mentions. Sister, can you just... Are you able to move to the second point? He's mentioned the first point, which was what? Yes, I am. Um, it was blood. <clears throat> I will move yeah, to the well, second okay. point. Okay, let's move on to the second point. of my father he died and he shed his blood on that cross for you and without the shedding of blood you could not be forgiven the second thing that you can't do without hebrews 11 6 hebrews 11 6 just turn a couple pages over hebrews 11 6 without faith it is impossible to please him now, Christ has already done the work on the cross, but now comes your part. Without faith, you cannot please him. Hebrews 11 has been called God's hall of fame. And after this passage, some of the men and women of faith are listed, like Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses, and even a prostitute, Rahab, because she too believed in God and proved her faith by her works. Well, you say, what is faith? I've committed all kinds of sins, and, and, and I know that I, I have to have the blood, and now I find out I have to have faith. What is faith? How do I get this faith? Do you know what faith is? I'm not sure I can explain it all to you, but faith is believing and receiving what God has revealed. What God has revealed in this book, what God has revealed in nature, what God has revealed in conscience. And it can be defined as that trust in the God of the Scriptures and in Jesus Christ whom he sent for salvation. Faith is personal trust apart from any works in Jesus Christ. I cannot work my way to heaven. After I receive Christ as Savior, I prove that I'm a Christian by my works. Right. So but you cannot do one point. single thing to earn one minute. That is the second point. So the first one is without the blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. The second point is without faith. And now <clears throat> the third point, let's move on to the third point. wait on Jesus Christ. Jesus plus nothing. And I proved my faith in the workmanship of the carpenters by putting my whole weight on it. I'm asking you tonight to put your whole weight on Jesus Christ. Jesus plus nothing. Just Jesus. 
And then the third thing that you cannot do without. First, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Second, without faith, you cannot please him. Thirdly, for without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. Without me, you can do nothing. Now, of course, Jesus in this chapter is talking about the vine and the branches, and he's talking about fruit bearing. In other words, without me, you cannot bear any fruit. After you come to Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know what happens? The Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. Now, the Holy Spirit is the representative of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God the Father. He went away. He sent the Spirit of God here to this earth. The moment you receive Christ, the moment you put your whole weight on Christ, the Spirit of God comes to live within you, and He lives through you and in you, and He lives the Christian life through you. Now, uh, one of the most important chapters in all the Bible is this 15th chapter of John. And those of you that come forward tonight, we're going to give you a Gospel of John. And I hope you'll read this chapter right away because it's an important picture of our Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship to Him. You see, this is the grapevine that he's talking about. And grapevines were grown all over Palestine in those days. And they needed a lot of attention. They grew fast. So we see in the divisions there how Billy Graham, one of the greatest preachers that ever lived, and according, I did mention this to you before, apparently he's preached to more people in the world than anyone in the history of the Christian church. He's preached, uh, that means even he's preached to more people than Jesus himself or even um, the, um, the Apostle Paul. How true that is, I, I do not know, but um, that is based on hearsay. Now, uh, what I would like to also mention to you is that in when we have a, um, a body, the sermon should always have the answer the following questions or it's always good that you try and write them down uh, one it should be the what that is the first question that you should ask what and then we should look at why and uh, looking at why means uh, looking at a cause and effect why is this happening and then you could give a testimony and then you could give authority and induction, an analogy, deduction, uh, refutation, and uh, experience. Then you should also concentrate on the how. Uh, the purpose of this division is to set forth the manner and method by which the theme of a sermon may be brought about or the condition under which it may be received or fulfilled. And then it should answer the question as to what then? Um, and then the application may assume various forms. Uh, there can be instruction, can be persuasion, um, and then actions and emotions. Um, you want to ultimately appeal to the heart, not only just the reason. The reason is very, very important that we appeal to your intellect, but a sermon must also appeal to the emotion. And then uh, uh, from that then we would then move towards the conclusion <clears throat> of the sermon. I have here in my, in my library, I'm sure you may have seen this, I have sermons and talks of Mrs. White, volume one. So I have the actual sermons that she preached in my hands so it would do you well to look at how mrs white organized or designed her sermons and then i have also sermons and talks by mrs white volumes two um, that is when you are serious about preaching you'll make a collection of these so if you do and you are able to get i would encourage you to get yourself or procure yourself a copy of such. 
I know that Dr. Um, Derek Morris, uh, who was at Southern, now he's at the General Conference. He used to, um, he, he told us that he asked permission from Dr. C.D. Brooks to transcribe his sermons. And I had myself um, intended to meet Dr. Brooks. I tried to procure an appointment through um, the president who was a pastor of the Oakwood Church. And he said to me, as soon as I come up, I should be able to go with him to Washington to meet Dr. C.D. Brooks. Unfortunately, Dr. Brooks passed on before I could meet him. But one of the things that I wanted to ask was also to just have a look at the copy of his sermons um, and see what they looked like. Now, I do want to say that there is an interview um, conducted by Dr. Derek Morris um, of Oakwood. He was, well, he was not of Oakwood, he was of Southern Adventist University during the time that I was studying there, uh, which he conducted with uh, Dr. Benjamin Rees. Dr. Benjamin Rees was one of the um, um, teachers of homiletics at Oakwood, and he was also the president of Oakwood during my time. I, um, just for a matter of our uh, class, um, try to get this. I don't know, sister, if you are able to load it, if you can load that interview which I sent to you so that we can look at it. Uh, some questions pertaining it. to um, how you, you approach a text between the, 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 the process between the preacher and the text and so forth, and some challenges in, in preparing sermons. But from the greatest preachers, Dr. Um, Derek Morris himself was a powerful preacher. He has two doctorates. Um, he did his one uh, doctorate while I was still at Southern. His second doctorate was on um, how to teach uh, preachers to preach. Basically, that's what he's... So, by him conducting this interview with Dr. Benjamin, tells me how serious he still considers preaching. He was always in love with preaching, and um, so let's let's listen to that interview. Welcome to Ministry in Motion, where we explore best practices for your ministry in the 21st century. Whether you're a pastor or a lay leader in your local church, today's topic will be extremely helpful. Called to preach with power. And our guest, Dr. Benjamin Reeves. Ben, it is great to have you with us on the program today. It's a joy and a privilege for me. And you have a distinguished career as a teacher of preaching, as a pastor, as a university president, now as special assistant to the president of Adventist Health System for mission and ministry. That's correct. And for folks who don't know about Adventist Health System, that's 46 hospitals with 78,000 employees. Is that right? That is correct. That's a huge mission. Yes, it is. And you're serving 4.7 million Just people about. a year. So here you've got a wonderful opportunity. Now, I'd love to talk to you about that assignment, but you have flowing in your veins a passion for preaching the Word of God. That is true. And so I'm honored that we can talk in this program about called to preach with power. And I'd like to start by asking you when you first sensed the call to preach. I, I first sensed the call when I was a student at uh, Pine Forge Academy in Pennsylvania. Still a teenager. Still a teenager. It's interesting that that was when I, I sensed the call. But earlier years, 
around the home church, others seem to have sensed something. And uh, you would get the comments of, you're going to be a preacher, or the Lord wants you to be a preacher. And so that laid a little background, but as far as a personal focus, it was Pine Forge that uh, marked that. Some great preachers came out of that territory, and there were some good mentors there, too. Absolutely. Great preachers came out, and great preachers visited, running weeks of prayer, etc. And uh, it was a tremendous opportunity to observe. But I must say that in my early, early years, there was also that opportunity, and I really enjoyed and appreciated it. I didn't see myself going into ministry, but I enjoyed hearing the preached word, well-spoken, mm. and it, it, it really mattered to me. And then later on, of course, it had its effect. Now, we've all met people who have a lot of potential and may even be affirmed by others, but they never develop that potential. So I want to ask you a very practical question. How did you develop your potential as a preacher? Actually, the development, and it sounds a little strange, was not development toward being a preacher. The development was the development that came from a great love for the written word. I grew up in Harlem in New York City, and there was a library, the Mount Morris Park Library. My brothers and my sister, we spent hours at the library, and when we would leave, we would have armfuls of books. And it was there that I developed a great appreciation for a well-written phrase, and then in listening for a well-spoken phrase. That began to create a sense of communication and how important it could be. And that sort of marked my journey, and then as I got the call, I married the two. So this love for uh, a well-written phrase, a well-spoken phrase, yes. and now God is saying, I want to, you to use that passion, those gifts, Correct. in communicating the gospel message. Correct. And he had, he, had, he had affirmed, you know how it is when you grow up around the church, and um, people tend to ask you uh, repeatedly to be on a program and to recite a poem and so forth. And I did get many of those opportunities. Someone's watching and they're saying, well, I just watch television. I don't, uh, I don't read at all. Could I, could I accomplish the same goal of developing a love for words by watching the television, do you think? Uh... I think you can be helped. I don't think you can have the same impact. There is something about the written word and then hearing the written word as you are reading it and sounding it out that makes a difference. It's one thing for me to watch someone else who is speaking and, and appreciate that, and yes, but there's something about reading the written word, getting caught in the rhythm it makes a difference. I've noticed I'm listening to an audio book right now. Sometimes I have to hit the little thing that points it back 30 seconds because when I'm reading, I could look at that phrase again. Correct. I could kind of weigh the phrase and appreciate it. Spoken word comes by one time unless you've got a rewind button. <laughs> So you're developing your potential. We're going to talk about the process of, of developing the sermon, but what were some of the challenges you faced as God was calling you to, to use this passion for a well-written, well-spoken word to communicate the gospel? What were some of the challenges? One, one of the challenges was, why? Mm. What's your motivation? Mm. Uh, is it because you see ministers in prime spotlight is that what's going on mm. what what is this about or is there a real sense that god has something for you to do for him to his glory and that should not be lightly considered how long did it take you to get over that challenge of thinking am i just doing this so i can be up front to saying 
God has put this in my heart. Actually, you said, get over it. <laughs> you never get over it. Mm. You need to always revisit yourself and your motivation. Mm. Sometimes, well, many times, we spend a lot of time working on a sermon, shaping. And the question is, why? Why so much effort put forward? Is it for the power of the word and its blessing to the hearer or? Attention to me. Yeah. After the break, we'll talk more about how we can craft a powerful message. But a word of caution, it's not about drawing attention to yourself. It's not about making a name for yourself. It's about communicating the good news of a God who loves us and has a plan to give us a future and a hope. After the break, we'll look more at Called to Preach with Power with our guest, Dr. Benjamin Reeves. Um, I just want to say something there. Um, I just want to say something there. Um, <clears throat> I want students to please listen to this interview. <clears throat> the reason being both teachers, these uh, uh, doctors that you are listening to there, are both experts in homiletics. Dr. Morris taught me uh, spiritual uh, formation, Dr. Derek Morris, while I was at Southern. <clears throat> and he's the one who told me about the scholarship that I won in preaching. He said to me, that scholarship was kept by God for me because um, the person who had did not donated or made the scholarship available had put it there, where, but with conditions. It would be for someone who would excel in homiletics, but with the intention to go back to his country. And in all those years, no one fulfilled that criteria until I came along. So it was Dr. Morris who told me that and congratulated me for topping the class in homiletics. So these are specialists in homiletics and preaching, the two that you're listening to in the Adventist church. Him, the two plus uh, Dr. Jones, who was at Andrews, and Dr. Mervyn Warren, of course, uh, whom we are utilizing his material. So very important to listen as to what really um, makes the preacher the preacher. Um, the, the questions they're asking and the discussion very relevant for us that are interested in homiletics. We may continue, sister. Thank you. Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Our topic today, called to preach with power. Our guest, Dr. Benjamin Reeves. Ben, thanks for sharing your own story and, and that caution about why am I doing this? And you say that, that should never go away. I, never. I should, no, no matter how effective a preacher becomes. In fact, maybe it's even more important then. We'll come to that later in the program. Let's talk about the journey from... Uh, text to sermon. Uh, that's assuming that we're biblical preachers, so we start with the text. Um, how does that journey uh, begin for you, and how does it unfold? Let me um, rephrase that just a bit, that the journey for me begins one of two ways. Either it begins with an idea hmm? that drives me to a text, okay. or it begins with a text that gives me an idea. Okay. But either way, as one scholar said, you have a text. If you don't have a text for ungrammatical emphasis, he said, what is you doing? <laughs> and, but there's power in that. Sure. Either way, start with a text that gives you an idea or an idea that drives you to a text. Mm. So I, I sense, for example, the need for healing in a community. That's, that's an idea. Absolutely. And then I, I, the Lord leads me to a text that he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Right. So I allow that scripture in Psalm 147 to unfold and to speak to that, to that issue. And, and part of that process is also making sure that the text that you go to 
says what you are saying it says. Right, so you're not eisegeting the Correct. text or reading into the text what you want to say. Correct. Doing violence to the yes. text. Especially if you think you've got a great idea. Yes. Oh, the temptation is to kind of <laughs> make the text fit the idea. And if the idea is sound, you will find a biblical oh, basis. yes. may yes. need a little work. How, how early in the process, typically a, a preaching appointment comes on the weekend, how, how early in the process do I need to settle that, that passage that's going to provide the foundation for my message? I would say the earlier, the better. It doesn't always happen that way. But uh, by midweek, you ought to have a sharp sense. And I tend to use some of the phrases that are common to H. Grady Davis, mm -hmm. um, noted homiletician. You, you, you should have a sense at that point about what it is you are talking about and what you're saying about it. Mm -hmm. Davis identifies those as the structural questions. Right. And uh, by midweek, you need to have that. Now, what that does for you is it sharpens the focus so that in your research, you're not just reaching out, getting material, piling it on the desk. Well, maybe this will work, maybe that will No, no. It's a focused, focused. search. Mm -hmm. And it can make all the difference in the movement of your progress mm -hmm. in preparing the sermon. So this idea, I, I know there are emergencies, but if your habit is uh, preparing the night before or on the way to church, uh, you, you're not going to have that time for that to settle. Oh, absolutely not. And I used to be quite uh, intense about that. I would tell ministers in workshops, you're paid to take the time mm. to prepare. Mm -hmm. So when you say, well, I don't have time, let's take a look at that. That's why you are paid. Of course, you don't do it for pay, but you are paid. And with the use of media today, even streaming uh, online, you can speak not only to the few hundred in your congregation, but to 20, 50,000 people. You never know what an appointment or a sermon will do. Mm -hmm. For instance, I spoke in California at a gathering. I was not aware of it, but someone taped the sermon. Later on, that person sent that tape to preaching for today. Mm. They made it part of their preaching club. Later on, <laughs> Preaching for Today shared that tape with the Chicago Sunday Evening Club. Hmm. Out of that, for 21 years, I've been a featured speaker on the Chicago Sunday Evening Club. So anytime you preach or prepare, do it like it really matters. Yes, and it does. Man. Yes. Man. Now, I know that words are important. And you said no matter how skilled you become, you, you, know, you always stay humble. What about writing a manuscript? There are some people that say, when you write a manuscript, it sounds like a chapter in a book. You should just have an outline. Don't, don't worry so much about the details. There are others who say, no, a manuscript's crucially important, but should be written in an oral style. Uh, talk to me about the importance of a manuscript from your perspective. Well, I would start with first, the writing of a manuscript forces you to employ all of your literary skills. When you don't have that process of writing, you don't realize how limited your off-the-cuff vocabulary is. Mm. But when you write and you can look back over as you have referenced, mm -hmm. you begin to see, oh my goodness, I'm using that word a, a thousand times. Mm -hmm. Sounds like that's the only word I know. <laughs> but writing the manuscript gives you a chance to expand your linguistic arsenal. And how do I make sure, that, I remember one time one of my sons came after a sermon and said, it sounded like they just read a chapter from a book. Uh, and there are other people, but they write a manuscript like it's a living conversation. How, how do you do that? Is it a certain thought pattern in your mind? It is a thought pattern, and it is also a discipline of writing for the ear. Mm. And that, in part, comes not just with writing, but also experiencing the, sp the speaking of the words, the rhythm of the words. Mm. That is very important. 
uh, after the break, we want to talk about how to move from a well-crafted manuscript into a powerful sermon. But um, some people take the manuscript with them and, and kind of internalize it and partly read it. Others, um, they leave it, but they've written it. I, I, is it just what works for you? What, what do you think? Well, absolutely. Uh, what works for you but also what communicates to the people. So listen to the feedback, and after the break, we'll talk about how to learn from people, because ultimately, the manuscript's not the final product, is it? No. It, it's a powerful sermon. This is helpful. By the way, we have a, a free book we want to give to, to those of you who write into us at ministryemotion.tv, which will give you some more insights about Call to Preach with Power. But after the break, how do you move from a well-crafted sermon manuscript to a powerful sermon. We'll be right back with more Ministry in Motion. Can we just pause there, sister? How are you finding this interview so far? Um, I think I think it's... Uh alive it's alive because um especially when he uh, stresses the fact that you never know how far one sermon could take you just as you said doctor you preached a sermon and it, it gained you a scholarship and look how far you went through that so i think uh as he shows there's no shortcut you need to uh, invest the time in it if you are uh, have to deliver a uh, prepare first a powerful sermon. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That is that's profound what you just met, said now, and uh, I also would like to to echo and see if what I have been speaking about uh, throughout, if that is echoed and resonated by these icons in homiletics. Um, sister, yes. How do you find? Yes. It? Yes, definitely. Um, what you've told us and what you've taught us definitely is, is echoed, especially in this interview. Fantastic. Let's go ahead and listen to the rest of the interview. Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Our topic today, Call to Preach with Power. Our guest, Dr. Benjamin Reeves. And Ben, it's just been exciting to talk to you. I feel like I'm learning again the importance of writing for the ear, mm -hmm. uh, uh, well-crafted phrases. And, and you emphasize the importance of a manuscript where you can go back and look, see if you're kind of carelessly repeating words rather than uh, maybe not illustrating something. Uh, but we've got to move from the manuscript to a powerful sermon. What, what's the process for that? Well, it, uh, it might follow this sort of sequence that when once you have written that manuscript, and I'm, I'm very strong on that, write the manuscript, then some suggest you may want to consider the idea of an oral brief where you talk through the manuscript without looking at the manuscript to give yourself a sense of what you might carry orally into the pulpit. Others, and this is probably where I come down, either you take in preaching notes based on the manuscript, mm -hmm. or you may take just a one sheet with a few texts mm -hmm. or nothing at all, but it's really not nothing at all, no. because what you're really taking is all of the work that's gone on before in writing, processing, reviewing, and then marrying as part of your being the spoken word. I had a history teacher. He, he used to allow students to take a, a, one sheet of paper into the exam. He figured if they had organized their thoughts and had uh, um, understood the material, that was just like a little cue for them. You can't write everything down on the paper. So you wouldn't scold a, a pastor or preacher who's, who said, I'm, I'm going to take a a few notes up with me. Absolutely not. Absol in fact, I might commend him depending on what he did with those few notes. If that, that was took. his only or her only preparation. Then we've got a problem. 
I like that oral brief. Some have described this internalization process like a tour guide mm -hmm. walking and pointing out the main uh, uh, moves of the sermon. So, so I'm obviously wanting to do that uh, before the morning of, of preaching the sermon. Absolutely. You, early on, you've got to get, again, we back all the way up, a clear sense of what is it I'm talking about and what am I saying about it. And once you get that focused, you can even back off for a day because the mind will continue to work mm -hmm. to generate ideas and material. And you'll find yourself, as I like to say, putting meat on the bones. So illustrations may come because you know what okay. your main idea is. You know where you're going. Okay. You know what you want to say. And uh, doing that then enables you to, if you want to make the move from written, having written the manuscript, then moving into the pulpit with either notes or no notes, the writing is crucial. It's crucial. Was there um, a process that you worked to develop that um, oral interpretation, that, that enthusiasm, the gesturing? Did, did someone teach you how to do that? Did you watch great preachers? Yes, watching. But also, again, I'm, I'm a big proponent of be who you are. Okay. Now, just because certain preachers have certain gestures fits them, may not fit you. So don't, don't, don't buy into that. But you do want the freedom to be and do who you are. And actually, that adds to the credibility of the spoken word for the hearer. I found that good preparation uh, increases your freedom because you're not scrambling and panicking. You've got a clear idea and clear moves, and so you can focus more on effective delivery. And it allows you to give the congregation the sense that you are on your way somewhere mm. and you know where you're going. And it's not one of those Jericho sermons, you know, round and around and around and around until, well, maybe the walls will come down. Right, or collapse. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you, you have been honored as a great preacher. Uh, you have trained many great preachers. You've also been clear about a danger that can come as you become more effective uh, in your preaching. What is that danger? It's an insidious danger. It's the a danger of drinking the Kool-Aid mm. or believing the PR. And you begin to think that somehow this is about you and what you can do. And that danger really surfaces when you are at a point of prominence. Mm. And people will say, oh, I just, oh, you're, you're the greatest ever, you know. And uh, the danger is that you begin to believe it, and then the Lord senses you believe it. And sometimes the Lord will say, well, if that's what you think, you take the sermon, go. Let's see what you can do. Mm. I've experienced it. So humble yourself under <laughs> the mighty hand of God. Yeah, what's the illustration? Go up in the pulpit the way you came down, mm. and you could have come down the way you went up. Mm. Staying humble before God. Staying humble before God. This is his enterprise. It's our privilege. Amen. Amen. If you've been blessed by some of the insights today called to preach with power, we have a special gift for you. Uh, in this book, Powerful Biblical Preaching, Practical Pointers from Master Preachers, one of the interviews is with Dr. Benjamin Reeves. There are more insights that can help you. If you would like to continue to grow to preach with power, stay humble in the process. We have 25 copies of this book. We'll send one. If you're the first request from your country, you can write to us at feedback at ministryinmotion.tv. We do that because if it airs first Thank on the sir. Pacific Rim, we don't want to send all 25 there and none to other parts. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> by God's grace, Dr. Jones is also going to release a book similar to that um, in the next coming not too long maybe probably a year from now but um, i would like us to procure a copy of that uh, book so we must order one 
uh, sister or more, um, particularly because I know the the authors uh, and uh, the people involved there. Um, as his doctorate, his second doctorate, Dr. Um, Derek Morris did it while I was a student at Southern. He went and interviewed the greatest preachers um, in his lifetime and as part of his PhD uh, research. So that book is an, an interesting book to have and a valuable one to have. Um, ladies and, or lady and gentlemen, uh, because of time constraints, we will have to terminate or end our program, but I would like you to encourage you to raise questions if you do have them. The reason why I'm going through this process, sort of um, almost like going through it again, because we did mention about how a body should be done, how an introduction should be done, is because we are heading towards a point where I'm going to require an assignment where you will have to draw up a sermon. And I will be looking at these various elements um, that comprise a powerful sermon. So um, take good note of that and then make reference and use of how to prepare sermons by William Evans, a classic, a great classic. <clears throat> now, I would also like you to look at the conclusion of a sermon uh, by William Evans, page 89. I know that you may not have the pages, but it's chapter 10, how to, how, how, uh, conclusion of the sermon, how to conclude a sermon. I will demonstrate that through video also. And, uh, but I want to encourage you again, ask questions. I will not know what is lacking in your mind unless you raise questions. Is there any question that you have for today <clears throat> or two? None. Thank you, Doctor. No. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Kauta, for attending. And um, I hope you gained something today uh, that is, will help you in your preaching or your sermon preparation. Anyone want to pray for us voluntarily? All right. No, let, let us pray. Thank you. Uh, Dear Lord, thank you so much for once more blessing us with words from above. Um, we are grateful even for the gift of life. Lord, we pray that um, all these uh, lessons which Dr. has echoed to us as also we witness from the great preachers, that Lord will take it to heart. And as we are willing to learn, you will empower us through your Holy Spirit as we put effort on also on our side. Lord, we pray that may you guide us through the activities of the day. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we ask all this. Amen. Amen. Thank you very Amen. much. I appreciate you attending. Thank you, Doctor. Our next class will be on uh, Sunday evening. Please do attend and um, come with questions if you have and let's discuss. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Thank you. God Thank bless. You.